Hello everyone, good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. Um, we're currently letting people in, so we'll be starting in the next two minutes. Um, until then, you're very welcome and I look forward to um, the rest of the conversation with you. All right, now we can start. Good afternoon, everyone, again, and um, welcome to the Youth at Work webinar series. My name is Chama Kanwachuko. I am the moderator for this series of discussions. This is the fourth webinar we've had in the past few weeks, and each one has been better than the last. So I do hope after today's own, you've tried to attend the rest. So the Youth at Work webinar series is a series of six webinars to promote evidence-based policy making, experts knowledge sharing, and good practices on youth employment in Africa. So at each webinar, we have put forward one evidence synthesis paper, which was commissioned by Include in the Spotlight, um, and had discussions and presentations on them. This evidence synthesis papers are the outcome of the partnership Boosting Decent Employment for Africa's Youth, consisting of includes Canada's International Development Research Center, IDRC, and the International Labor Organization, ILO, under the aegis of the Global Initiative on Decent Jobs for Youth. Again, my name is Chema Kawachuku, and I will be moderating today's session. Um, and today we're going to be focusing majorly on policies and government actions. So last week we had a fruitful discussion on youth at work with a focus on conflicts and crisis. Um, the previous week we had a conversation focusing on the rural economy. And before that we had a conversation focusing on the green economy. And I have to tell you that every webinar has led me to learning a little more about um, youth unemployment and the recommendations going forward. So I'm looking forward to today's conversation very much. We have a lot of um, interesting presentations and distinguished authors <coughs> that will be making presentations today. <clears throat> And I do hope that at the end of the day, we come up with very strong and concrete resolutions from today's conversation. First of all, I'd like to start um, with a few ground rules. Um, there are not so many, but just to make sure things run smoothly. First of all, the webinar is being recorded um, for your information and parts of the recordings will be used on the include social media and website. <clears throat> and then if you would like to um, speak, please raise your hand to speak and you will be unmuted. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the Q&A section or the comment section in the chat, and we will collect them and address them in the time allocated to clarification questions and discussion. So those are all the ground rules for today. I do hope that we have a very fruitful discussion. I will start now by introducing our first few speakers um, that will be making presentations on the topic. The first speaker I'll be introducing is Saskia Van Ven. She is the um, one of the authors of the evidence synthesis papers being presented today. And she's a senior impact measurement and knowledge specialist at Oxfam Novib. She's an experienced researcher in the field of evaluation in the development sector and, and coordinates large scale multi-country evaluations and learning trajectories with particular interest in youth, SRHR, and social justice and inclusion. Her work contributes to valuable co-created knowledge that is robust as well as useful for program adaptation in Oxfam. She holds an MSc in International Public Health and a PhD from the VU University of Amsterdam. 
Um, the next um, author is Maria Miseke. She is Maria Miske. She is um, also um, one of the ESP authors, and she's an impact measurement and knowledge specialist at Oxfam Novib. Her work at Oxfam centers on supporting teams in Oxfam to evaluate the impact of their interventions and inform their programs and campaigns with evidence-based recommendations. She holds a master's degree in developed economics. Um, and then finally, we have Ahmed Ali. He is also one of the presenters for the ESP um, paper. And he is the Just Economy and Economic Development Coordinator at Oxfam Novib in Somalia. He has experience in structuring, financing, and implementation of innovative and large scale impact programs. And he works in the economic development field to fuel healthier eco economic ecosystems that create more decent jobs, skill, skills building, educate individuals, connect efforts, accelerate innovation, foster economic inclusion, and strengthen economic growth with a particular focus on youth and women. And then the final speaker I'll be introducing right now, that's the first batch of speakers, is Brent. Um, is Brent. Um, Brent is from ILO, and he is an employment specialist in ILO's decent work team for East and Southern Africa. And in his role, he's responsible for providing technical guidance and support to organizations members with regard to designing and implementing employment creation policies and initiatives. Thank you to all our speakers for being here today. Um, and I'd like to now hand over the floor to Marieke um, and Ahmed, who will be leading the first presentation of the evidence synthesis paper. Um, you have the floor now. Yeah, thanks, uh, Jamaka. I'm going to share my screen. So one second. I'm assuming you can uh, see it all now. Um, yeah, so thanks for, for the introduction. Uh, and I have the honor to uh, kick off the presentation of the evidence synthesis paper that we uh, wrote together with colleagues from across the Oxfam Confederation. And uh, yeah, it focuses on uh, government youth employment policies in, uh, and programs in Africa that advance inclusive growth. Um, yeah, and the objective of the paper really was to understand how African governments are working towards inclusive growth uh, in Africa in which all youth participate. And uh, this was operationalized using um, yeah, three research sub questions uh, also depicted on the slide. So the first uh, the, and main research question focused on inclusive growth. Uh, what is done uh, to advance inclusive growth. The second sub-question focused on uh, whether uh, yeah, these policies and programs are also cognizant of the diversity among youth. And uh, thirdly, um, we uh, uh, analyzed whether these policies and programs are also meaning meaningfully involving youth in, the, in its uh, formulation and implementation. And uh, yeah, so these research questions uh, were analyzed by means uh, of a desk review uh, of mainly academic and grey literature. And these findings were complemented with case studies. So we had uh, three case studies from uh, Ethiopia, Uganda, and Somaliland. And each uh, case study relates to, it, uh, yeah, to its own sub-research uh, question. And uh, yeah, later in this presentation, Ahmed will share a bit about uh, the case study from Somaliland, specifically on meaningful youth participation in uh, policy formulation and implementation. And I will now um, yeah, briefly share some of the key highlights from the paper. Yeah, so firstly, uh, inclusive growth. So um, generally there's not, yeah, no universally accept the definition of inclusive growth, but uh, the common thread among definitions that we found was uh, yeah, that it takes a holistic uh, view towards growth and that uh, it focuses on growth that reduces inequality and poverty. So uh, yeah, it, it, it promotes inclusion and opportunities uh, for everyone to pursue a better life. Um, and within uh, inclusive growth policies, it's also important to consider uh, specifically uh, policies or programs uh, related to youth employment. And uh, we saw all in all that there's a rising trend in Africa towards the development of uh, policies and programs that have an inclusive growth goal uh, in mind. And uh, uh, common approaches uh, used by the government uh, on this goal uh, are, yeah, include, for instance, national youth policies, uh, value chain and market system development, uh, active labor market policies, uh, but also direct employment of youth in the public sector. And in the paper, we give several examples of uh, each of these different approaches. 
Yeah, so we found that um, generally a, a comprehensive and complementary package of uh, interventions that sim simultaneously address both the demand and the supply side uh, of the labor market are most effective. Um, however, we also found that uh, most, uh, or not most, but that often policy and programs tend to focus more on the labor supply side rather than the demand side. So this is a, yeah, potentially could also hamper uh, inclusive growth because, well, yeah, jobs need to be there in the first place uh, to absorb the labor force. Uh, secondly, um, so effective, the effectiveness, sorry, the effectiveness of policies and programs also uh, highly depends on economic growth itself and the types of jobs that are created. And uh, here a balance ne needs to be found between several trade-offs, for instance, uh, job creation in the formal versus informal sector uh, in rural versus urban areas, but also the quantity versus the quality of jobs. And um, yeah, for instance, with, this, uh, with regards to this last trade-off, um, the policy of creating more jobs uh, might or could be complicated uh, with the focus on decent, uh, decent work because, uh, well, in, uh, this also potentially increases the employment cost. So these are yeah, just an example of, of the complication in the, in the trade-offs that, uh, that are made. And a final requirement for inclusive growth uh, policies and program, programs is that uh, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's necessity of uh, ensuring a strong link with uh, local actors uh, because contextualization uh, is helpful in understanding the constraints of different groups uh, of youth and uh, therefore tailoring the, the, the policies to different needs. Um, and of, yeah, of course, also strong local links is essential for successful implementation in the end. Uh, yeah, then we also focused in the paper on youth diversity and meaningful uh, youth participation. So we found that uh, related to diversity that uh, often policies and programs do recognize diversity of youth and uh, they formulate that uh, or that they include it in the formulation stage. Uh, however, we also found that often, um, yeah, target groups are still formulated in a more general sense. So they talk about women or they talk about rural youth. So this uh, can be complicated in the operationalization of the, of the policy because um, yeah, it does, so it, it does not uh, uh, formulating a target group, uh, including a target group in the formulation does not necessarily mean that it's also uh, in, the, in its implementation that it's tailored to different needs of, of different groups. So yeah, all in all, it's, uh, youth diversity is at the core of formulation, but not necessarily also at the implementation stage. Um, yeah, secondly, the, we focused on meaningful youth participation. And um, well, first of all, meaningful youth participation represents an inclusive, intentional, mutually respectful partnership between young people and adults. And there's growing recognition of its uh, importance. Uh, however, yeah, in the study, we, we found that uh, even though its importance is uh, the recognition of its importance is growing, that still the operationalization or uh, yeah, it remains limited or tokenistic, especially at the decision-making stage. Um, yeah, and I will now hand over to Ahmed for a deep dive uh, in the case study from Somaliland, especially on uh, uh, meaningful youth participation. Thank you very much, Marika. Um, thank you so much, and uh, uh, thank you for your, uh, your presentation. Um, given the context in Somalia, and in, in Somaliland, um, there is a very high unemployment in, in Somaliland, uh, 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 specifically. Somaliland population is estimated 3.5 million, um, with 70% of the population is under 30 years of age. Uh, given that it's, it's huge, uh, there are you know, young people there. Uh, 39 of them are, are now working, while no employment or education or training status uh, affects 36 percent of the youth, with majority of uh, uh, you know being young women. Uh, in that sense, um, 60 percent of young people uh, are now have intention to leave the country to pursue better economic opportunities elsewhere. Uh, this high unemployment in Somalia, particularly, 
is is caused by several structural and political issues, uh, including uh, lack of skills, uh, slow economic growth, um, climate conditions, uh, political instability, insufficient of, of, of job opportunities in the market, have created a high level of frustration among young people. These challenges also created big, uh, you know, gender gap in terms of job division between men and women uh, in employment market. So, responding to that, a, a, a young people from deaf, you know, a young people, you know, influential young people, activists, this came together in 2019 uh, uh, from universities, from civil society organizations. Um, and they come up with the coalition of Arbishaw coalition. Uh, Arbishaw is in, in, Soma, in English, it is an uh, uh, internship coalition. Uh, this Arbishaw coalition, they came together, they formed this coalition, and they called policy uh, intervention uh, from the government. Uh, they create, they, they, they feel like maybe internship is the, is the, is the entry, uh, you know, step for, for employment market. As entrepreneurship also is, is a challenge in Somalia, as in, because access to finance, business development services, mentorship, coaching, all these kind of uh, kind of services are really challenging in Somalia. Therefore, maybe they, they they feel like maybe getting into employment, maybe internship is the easy, easiest way to secure uh, a job. Um, so that is that is the reason they called internship uh, coalition. So they. Um, Previously, um, in Somaliland, there was no internship. Uh, there is, there was internship, but it was not structured. There was no policy guiding the internship uh, in, in the country. So there was no rights, no conditions uh, applies to internship. Uh, therefore, you, young people uh, securing internship in the private sector or public sector were very in, in a very high risk for being exploited in, long, in a long term, unpaid uh, labor, are not being provided meaningful learning or future jobs. Therefore, this is the reason that artificial condition formed and emerged. Um, so, so they advocated a, a, a creation of national internship policy, especially young people. Uh, there was a lot of public campaigns uh, uh, led by young people, a lot of social media and uh, news uh, a lot of uh, you know town hall, town hall meetings, a lot of meetings with the government, uh, asking for policy, uh, and that is when uh, Somaliland government has uh, initiated the idea of creating internship policy. So artificial coalition is being used in a platform to come up with 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 the, with, the, with, with, with to co-create with the policy. So government, uh, you know. Uh, a recruited consultant to lead the policy, closely working with Arab Civil Coalition, which is young led coalition, uh, young people led coalition. So the, the internship is being added to the national framework. The initial drafting, uh, 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 you know, the initial drafting, the validation, the launch, all, all, all in all the stages, young people were at the center of the of that of that of the development of that policy. So this national internship policy is seeking fairer, more inclusive ways for young people to, to enter employment and to contribute to the economy. Uh, it's been a unique process uh, how it came, came uh, uh, you know, in, in formulation. This kind of uh, policy formulation was unique uh, as it's rolled out by the, as it is, you know, rolled out, uh, initiated, and done jointly with young people and also the government. Um, since the establishment of the of this policy, uh, it's been taken to the government. Uh, I mean, the, the cabinet ministers, uh, the cabinet ministers uh, signed and approved, and it's passed by the by the government. Uh, I mean, the president, the president also endorsed the national internship policy uh, because it was because it's, it has really huge voice behind it. It was really priority uh, for the government to approve such a, such a national uh, internship policy. So um, as soon as, uh, soon as the, the president endorsed in 2020, uh, the national inter internship policy has assisted uh, 1, 000, uh, 3,100 unemployed youth 
uh, interim labor force. A lot of career centers, employability skills centers were also created to bridge gap between employers and job seekers. So we feel like this kind of policy were, were really unique and how it's emerged was really unique, uh, how, it's, 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 how quick it's been formulated and adopted and implemented it was very unique. And it's led by young people. That is how we feel like young people uh, are really uh, you know, participating uh, meaningfully in, 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 in anything to do uh, or anything related to their career, to their future uh, prospects. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, I will, I will, uh, I will, I will, I will be around. You know, you can, you can, you can, you can text or you can ask directly later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ned. Uh, I had one more slide, uh, Chimaka. Is there enough time for that? Um, yes, you have three minutes. Three minutes. I will be brief. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so thanks, uh, Ahmed, for, for that uh, for the case presentation. So uh, yeah, based on the literature review, uh, as well as the three cases, we formulated four um, key recommendations in this uh, paper. And the first one um, focuses on uh, the fact that it's important for, uh, for policies and programs that they, uh, at the formulation stage, already think through the realities of the implementation. Uh, yeah because that requires an aware capacitated research for implementation system at the local level uh, to ensure that yeah, these, these inclusive growth ambitions that they don't get lost in the formulation and uh, implementation stage. Um, secondly, um, a recommendation uh, on youth led innovation. So um, we believe that traditional value change alone will not create enough jobs uh, for young people. So therefore, um, it's important to also consider new economies and technologies, uh, digital, digital innovations, future of work, um, because in that way, many uh, more new jobs can arise for young people to set the standards of decent work. And um, yeah, so governments should uh, start thinking more creatively and uh, also consider the big contribution that innovation can make uh, in advancing inclusive growth and labor demand. And here, young people can uh, also be potential drivers uh, of this innovation. Um, yeah, so thirdly, it's important that uh, especially programs and policies uh, formulated at the national level that they also are tailored to local context and youth diversity. Uh, so this is basically a strong call for, uh, uh, for sorry, a call for strong contextualization at the local level. And a starting point there is understanding the different uh, needs of different groups of youth. And yeah, here again, a meaningful participation of youth is uh, key in understanding the different needs. And uh, yeah, lastly, uh, so it's important that young people are recognized and empowered as uh, drivers for change for youth employment and uh, inclusive growth. So they can, for instance, support in formulation to ensure that uh, policies and uh, programs that they recognize the different needs uh, and contexts of youth, but also in the implementation stage to make sure that, well, the implementation is also tailored to different groups, uh, but also to sensitize their communities, uh, for instance, and to really own the policies and programs that, uh, that are uh, drafted. And so here it's important that governments create an uh, enabling environment for youth to, uh, to participate. Uh, yeah, so this was it, uh, uh, our presentation, and uh, looking forward to hear about the others and to have an interesting discussion later. Thank you so much, Marike. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Um, I, I, um, there is a lot to be unpacked from that presentation, and thank you for um, having that conversation with us. We're going to have clarifying questions because I can already see that there are some questions for you in the chat. But we're going to first of all take Dr. Burns' presentation, and then we can take all the clarifying questions afterwards. So, um, um, Dr. Burns, you have the floor now. Okay. All right, thank you so much. And then first of all, no doctor needed. <laughs> uh, probably, I don't know. No, Burns is just fine. <laughs> Hi everyone. Thanks for having me. And then thanks for this uh, useful, in uh, useful initiative and um, also the great first presentation. I think I will agree a lot with, with what is being said, although maybe I, I might add a little 
nuance or different twist twist to it. But uh, uh, let's see. You know, maybe I'll be going a bit against the grain here in this forum, but I'm sure you let me know in the comments, and I'm, I'm of course happy to discuss. And, and that nuance you can already see in my title there where I put youth in brackets and I'll explain this a little bit more because I feel we need to be very conscious of how we address the wider problems. Where of course this, this big challenge of youth employment is situated and, and what gives rise to it so I'll try to, to explain this a little bit. And, and maybe just to, to also reintroduce myself I'm indeed from the ILO. We, I'm based here in Pretoria in South Africa, uh, and I have a role in, in promoting our constituents here in the region in Africa, particularly in Southern Eastern Africa, but across the continent on, on uh, youth employ or employment issues and employment policies. Right, as a bit of a background, but you all know this, and, then, and probably I'm going to go quickly through this, but as you know, it is an important context to what we're talking about. And, and we have done quite a few studies on the impact on, of COVID on, on Africa. And it's quite clear that, that in, unemployment has been very harsh. Youth, women and informal workers have been particularly badly affected. And then of course, this won't come uh, to anyone's surprise. Here. But I think we need to also put in context what this means. It doesn't only talk, mean that, that people have gotten unemployed. That would be too crude. Very often what we find in the African context, people are actually almost, what you can say, it's, it's not a nice thing in a way, but, but it, it's quite close to the truth. People are often too poor to be unemployed. There's no social protection systems. They need to get by to survive in some form or another. What that means is that they are actually still formally employed, but the employment is in incredibly bad, it's incredibly poor. So we, it, a much better description often is underemployment and actually working poverty. They are in employment, but living still in poverty. And very tellingly, over the past year or so, the rate of working poverty in Africa for the first time in 20 years has gone up and has gone up quite sharply. You see that in those red figures there. And that tells you a lot about the impact of this, this uh, crisis right now. Now, that brings me to, to deeper structural employment problems that we face on the continent. And I want to, it's again a slide I don't really like to, to give because it's very negative. It pay, paints Africa in a sort of uh, negative picture, but, but nevertheless, it gives sort of the context to what we're talking about. Now, if we talk about unemployment rate, uh, the country with the highest unemployment rate in, at the moment is in South Africa. It's down at 34.4%. Youth unemployment is well above the 50s uh, uh, and beyond. And, and, and this is the, just a narrow definition of unemployment. If we take the broad definition, it's much higher. Yet, uh, if we look globally, six out of the top 10 countries, top 10 in inverted commas, are African in terms of unemployment rate. If we look at productivity, uh, labor productivity or output per worker, the lowest 25 in the world, 21 countries are in Africa. Informality out of the top 25, again, in, in, in inverted commas, 21 countries, the top 21, out of the top 25, 21 countries are in Africa in terms of informality. And I, I referred to working poverty before, 22 out of the, the, the top 25 countries uh, are African and the other three are all war-torn countries. Now, why do I say this? Why do I bring this across? It tells us that, that overall, it's not just that youth per se uh, are, are, are struggling with unemployment or struggling in the labor market. Labor markets in general for everyone in Africa, basically. Of course, there's different groups, groups who are more affected, women in former workers I mentioned before are more affected, but there's a general structural issue with, in terms of the labor market and employment uh, on the continent. And youth are disproportionately affected, of course, also because of the demographics on the continent, but we know that it's a very youthful population. Now, for me, I would argue one of the main underlying reasons for all these very uh, sobering labor market outcomes is that simply speaking, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm being quite crude here, but I would, I would defend this point at the same time quite robustly, is that there simply is not enough labor demand compared to labor supply on the continent. There are not enough employment opportunities for all the many 
young people who are looking for them. And here I mean both jobs like wage jobs, but also op opportunities to be an entrepreneur, opportunities to be uh, a businessman or woman. There is not enough economic opportunity out there. That, that is in effect a, uh, um, a, a, a testament to the poverty per se, so to speak, if you get what I mean. Now, that means overall we need structural economic solutions to stimulate labor demand. And, and we need to look at those first and foremost, I would argue. So when we talk about policies, I would argue, and I'll come to that in the next slide, we don't just talk about youth employment policies or youth employment approaches. We need to talk about employment and policies and uh, approaches overall. So I would hasten a, a bit against just being youth specific, looking at youth specific approaches. We need to have, you, you mentioned in the previous presentation of the thing of thinking big, and I would, I would very much agree with that. And that reminds uh, that that needs bigger policies. Now that doesn't say we don't need to look at youth at all, far from it, of course. Like I said, youth are disproportionately affected, but then that means when we look at sectoral policies, we need to look at those sectors where youth are uh, more generally uh, affected or that are more relevant for their employment, where they're more likely to find employment, they're maybe more interested in going into those sectors and so on. So of course, we need to have a certain youth bias in our work. We need to have, a, certainly need to have a youth lens in our work, but it doesn't mean that we have youth specific or youth only approaches. I wanted to talk, but I, I worry I run out of time here a little bit. I wanted to talk about the centrality of structural transformation in this. Uh, very often also, especially in the African context, one talks about the opportunities in the, ag in, in the agriculture sector, and these are of course important. It's the mainstay of employment and uh, on the continent still. Uh, when it comes to youth employment, very often you hear this issue about attitudes and about the, the, the lack of attractiveness of the agriculture sector for, for youth. There's a lot of debates around that. And, and so, I think there's a broad acknowledgement that there is a need for structural transformation also away from agriculture. Now, what I wanted to bring across here, and again, I don't think I can go into too much detail, but is that that structural transformation also plays out not just on the sectoral level, agriculture services industries, but it also plays out on the labor market. And it means that the way that people are employed uh, shifts dramatically as countries go through structural transformation. Very quickly on this, on this graph, you see from left to right, uh, poor countries to the very richest countries. And you see, of course, a very market shift. And that shift is a, re a, um, a stark reduction of agricultural workers, the purple uh, area here, and a huge increase in non-agricultural wage and salaried workers. So as structural transformation unfolds, many people need to go into, or we would expect that at least, into wage and salary jobs often or usually outside agriculture. Now, how do we manage this transformation? How do we make this happen? I think it also very much speaks to youth because from what we know from service and so on, usually we find that actually that is very much in their interest. They want to have stable uh, uh, jobs. It's not necessary that, that they just want to be entrepreneurs. I, we have studies on that. I can't go into detail here, but, but that, that this is very much something that, that many young people in Africa uh, seek. So, so, so that is something that needs to be managed also through policy. So very quickly, what, what are we trying to uh, do in that regard from ILO? Our main product, if I can say on this, is what we call national employment policies, although we have shaped this over time. Uh, it, it has been, it's guided by ILO as a normative organization, as a standard setting organization by uh, the Employment Policy Convention, which I know is quite old, it's from 1964, which basically says that any national employment policy sh uh, should adhere to three basic principles. It should create work for everyone who's available and looking for work. That work needs to be as productive or as qualitative or as positive as, as possible, and there shouldn't be any discrimination. So quite basic principles that any one of us, I think, can get behind. Uh, we as such don't actually see or really acknowledge that much the, 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 the trade off between the quantity and the quality of the work. Maybe in the discussion, we can go into that a bit more because it's maybe a slightly different point, differing point to the previous uh, presentation. 
but but we feel the quality and the quantity are actually mutually reinforcing and feed into each other, especially when we look at the microeconomic picture. Now, I said this is from 1964, this basic framework. I feel it has stood the test of time still quite well. It's very relevant even today. But of course, we are developing that and, 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 and finding ways of reinterpreting that. And today we're talking of what we call a new generation of gender responsive national employment policies. This means not just that we have a national employment policy, a document. Far from it, we try to mainstream employment in, in, in a range of employment or economic policy areas, macroeconomic sector, labor market policy, and so on, to enhance the employment responsiveness overall. Uh, and I mean, we'd still do standalone policies, but, but we want to be much more comprehensive, integrated in that approach. And of course, by now, we, we have a range of different folk that, that add to those three dimensions that I said before. First of all, that policies are being implemented, that they're not, not just uh, papers gathering dust in, in some shelves, that we focus more on the demand side. I, I made that argument earlier. The future of work is an increasingly important context in this. The focus on youth, of course, is just as much, and that's what we're talking about here, but also then the latest development, so to speak, in the, in the world of work, uh, focusing on a human-centered recovery from COVID-19. So that shapes our work and how we want to uh, uh, support governments and, and, and constituents in all the various countries in trying to respond to these, the employment and youth employment crisis. Now, I mentioned it briefly, and again, I probably have to skip through this mostly, but we try to do this across a range of, of different policy areas, and all of these are equally important. So we need to have quite comprehensive frameworks, all of which try to basically push this agenda, move, create progress on these various areas. I could give you examples for each one of these, I won't have time for that, again, maybe for the discussion, but 10 minutes won't allow. But it's quite important that we look at all these different areas in order to shift or move forward in this uh, structural transformation that I mentioned. So let me try and conclude, and, and I think I, I said most things that I can do within the limit of time, and I hope that there's something for you to take away and certainly that we can discuss about. But we know, of course, the challenge that we faced but we need, in, in, in looking at the solutions, I think we still need to come back to the issue of the shortfall in labor demand. Uh, and, and that needs to have center stage. Unfortunately, I think very often when we talk about youth employment solutions, there's a bias towards the supplies. Maybe let me close on this point. We, very often when we talk about youth employment solutions, we talk about skills development, entrepreneurship development, access to finance, access to markets. All of these fundamentally are supply side interventions. There's nothing wrong with them. I, they are actually very important, but they must be informed by an identified or at least potential demand. So, so they, ne they need to be fulfilling a certain demand in the labor, in, in labor market. The problem is that most economies are demand side constrained. So identifying that demand will be difficult. It is therefore important that we stimulate demand, that demand first and foremost. Otherwise, what we do is what I would call changing the queue type of uh, uh, interventions. Yes, we train certain youth in terms of giving them new skills, and that might be very valuable for them in entering the labor market and they might find a job. But what actually that does, it doesn't create new jobs. It, it gives those people that we train, the beneficiaries, a certain uh, head start and an advantage in the labor market. And of course, then they will be more likely in finding employment. But that is what I say, it's changing the queue rather than actually creating new employments because you give some person a head up but another person then will lose out and the net unemployment rate basically will stay the same. So I would again maintain this point that, that if we don't couple these type of uh, intervention that was being said before with demand side interventions, and in fact, if we don't focus more on demand side rather than supply side interventions, it will be very difficult to tackle these crises. I'll leave it there. Uh, I hope something of use was in there and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernd. Um, and you know, you made a lot of very important points and one that I'd like to reiterate which is um, something that I have also seen in my work and discussions um, 
as a young person and with young people is that um, there's a lot of focus on upskilling, focusing on supply side, like you mentioned, focusing on how to make young people better prepared for jobs. But it's important to note that the demand side of youth employment is equally or even probably more important than um, um, just focusing on getting people ready for the jobs, because at the end of the day, that is the only intervention that will generate a net decrease in unemployment rates. So thank you very much for that. Um, we do already have a bunch of questions for some of our speakers. So I'm going to start with um, Marieke. I have a question um, direct. I have two questions um, for you. Um, so the first question is, um, can you give some more information about inclusive group growth, not just what it means, but what it is in practice? And the second question for you is, were the demand-focused policies also youth-focused, or were they generally promoting job-rich economic growth? And which type of policies did you include in the study? So those are the two questions for you that we can start with. Yeah, thank you. Um, maybe I start with the last uh, question, if that's all right. That's okay. Um, and just to clarify, maybe that was not clear from the methodology, but we um, didn't do um, a policy analysis. So we uh, instead we looked at literature, uh, also uh, some articles in literature that did a policy analysis, but it was not us uh, analyzing uh, different policies. Um, but we did find uh, examples in the literature from uh, some policies that, um, yeah, that were demand focused uh, and especially uh, or also had a focus on youth. So, for instance, um, there was a public works uh, scheme and a wage subsidy scheme in South Africa, if I believe, uh, if I remember correctly. But indeed, um, or and these these examples they had uh, a, a focus specifically on youth, but. Uh, yeah, this also relates to what, what Bernd was, uh, was saying, the, the, the examples of demand focused uh, policies, especially also with a focus on youth, was um, quite limited on what we, what we found. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the, the first question on uh, inclusive growth examples. So, um, yeah, in the paper we have a case study from Ethiopia and they uh, have some good examples on uh, inclusive growth. Um, on how they uh, uh, operationalize it. And I'm looking at the, at the examples right now. So for instance, they had the growth and transformational plan, and then uh, specifically also uh, looked at empowerment of uh, uh, women and youth uh, and private sector development. So in that sense, um, yeah, they at least uh, included some uh, pillars related to in, in, in inclusion of different groups. Um, yeah, and there were some other examples, uh, but maybe I would also like my colleague Saskia to uh, to step in here because she has been involved quite a lot with the development of that case study. Yeah, so that's fine, Marika. So if you look at uh, Ethiopia, I think also over the past decades, they have been quite front runners in Africa on um, inclusive growth and designing policies and strategies and actions related to that. Uh, and with that, they have showed their high ambition at the national level for this. Um, and they also have set up like a decentralized system to try to implement those policies in which various stakeholders were involved, like youth and women, uh, in the formulation of those policies and those strategies. Uh, however, what we saw, what that case study analyzed is that most of the participation of those youth and women were already uh, politically affiliated with the groups that were developing the policy. So in that sense, it was not like the diverse youth representation, especially if you look at rural areas uh, that you would like to hope for to boost rural um youth employment. Uh, so they cannot maybe considered as a true representative that can uh, voice the needs and demands of all young people in Ethiopia. And further on, we saw that in the implementation of those policies, especially through the decentralized system that Ethiopia has, it was quite difficult 
to for all the ambitions to be realized because just typically the resources were not there or the demand were not there uh, as Barnt was stating already so uh, in the implementation there is definitely uh, a difficulty for government actions to realize full youth employment so therefore I fully agree with, with Bernd that it's important to stress the agenda of the demand side more uh, in youth employment and also not only look at government action, but also at the actions that uh, private sector can make to focus on the demand and ensure that that's inclusive for different groups. Uh, so Oxfam in their youth employment programs are working more and more with also a, a lens on influencing and involving the private sector uh, in these programs to uh, stress them to also take their responsibilities in this respect. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Saski, and thank you, Margeke, um, for your answers to those questions. Um, I have one question. It wasn't directed at anybody in particular, but I think... Um, if Ahmed would want to answer this question or Marieke, since you worked on the paper. Um, so basically the question is, as 95% of young people work in the informal sector, as you mentioned, it seems that youth employment interventions need to be targeted directly at those sectors. Um, and this has come up many times in the webinar, the role of the informal sector, especially when you're talking about youth employment in Africa. So how, better or how do you think um, governments can be government programs can more effectively um, work with the informal sector or improve employment and employment conditions in the informal sector Ahmed do you want to take this question or yeah I think uh, yeah the question uh, okay um I think Somalia uh, I mean, you know, 90, around ninety-one percent of the of the businesses are operating in informal sector, yeah. Um, and 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 I think they are the major employers uh, in, in terms of uh, in terms of job, you know, employment, uh, uh, you know, labor market things, man. And I think yes, they don't provide any, uh, you know, a safe space or any. A decent jobs. It's there, there's no rights that uh, applies to informal sector. I mean, you know, the yeah. working hours is too long. They, they less they are underpaid, uh, and basically people are, are just uh, working for them because uh, are working in the informal sector because uh, they they have nothing else to do. So I think there's there are policies mm -hmm. that are now government of Somalia is working on. Uh, you know, uh, in the, the, um, a semi MSME's policy framework, uh, basically, which is campaign of of, of formalizing the, the informal economy, informal businesses, to get to uh, to to bring them into the formal uh, economy, so that they can uh, all, up, all all policies can apply. So I think encouraging this uh, kind of policies, this kind of engagement, is, is key uh, to have uh, to to get them into uh, informal economy. Uh, so this kind of uh, a semi policy framework or national entrepreneurship act or those policies at which is private sector so this i think will help uh, you know uh, 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 support informal economy uh, to become more formal and then therefore provide decent jobs uh, you know uh, for young people and women as well thank you and um, become more accountable yes yeah, so well, more accountable to to, to the government policies Yes, thank you very much for that. And, and the last point that you made about accountability and in, in all honesty, when, when there are government policies supporting the informal sector, it kind of becomes formal. So at the end of the day, you, you see some sort of transitioning when you're having more government regulation and support around um, um, in the informal sector. You are, that is still one way of creating decent jobs that will still and feedback into the formal economy. So, so that's important to mention. Thank you very much. So um, I have one question for Bernd and then we move on to the next um, round of presentations and then we'll take the rest of the questions afterwards. Um, so Bernd, the, the first question for you is, does the graph on structural transformation 
refer to formal work only or also informal work? And the second question is, um, so IDS um, has been working on um, a paper, has been working on several papers and they have shared the same message on the structural missing jobs problem and need for demand side intervention. If we link the two presentations, to what extent do you see youth engagement happening in these kind of employment promoting policies? All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Chiamaka. Uh, so the first question is very easy. I already wrote it in the chat. Yes, that, that graph includes all workers. Uh, so that includes the main form of economy. Maybe I, I want to get in that question very briefly because very often, I think we mistake the informal economy for a sector. It's not a sector. Informal work goes across all sectors, agriculture, service industries, and so on. It, it speaks much more to the employment conditions, the social protection that the workers have, and so on. But, but I think the words informal economy is actually much, much more precise. Uh, and, and we shouldn't forget that in the informal economy, you can just as much be a paid worker as you can be a businessman. There's always this misunderstanding that, that the majority of people in the informal economy are entrepreneurs, are self-employed, like the people we maybe see on the street selling, selling goods or, or, or um, uh, maybe farmers, small business and so on. But very often these are actually disguised wage employees. Uh, wage employed people who don't own the stuff that they're selling and so on. It's quite complicated, but anyway, we shouldn't assume that, that the, the structures that we see in the formal economy don't actually also imply, apply to the informal economy, only that in the informal economy, of course, we don't have the security, we, are, we don't have the employment conditions, we are, don't have the, the contracts and, and so on and so forth. Now, um, Engagement of, of youth in, in, in policy formation, for sure. I, I didn't have time to go into that, but, but there's absolutely no reason not to do that. To the contrary, we should very much um, uh, encourage and, 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 and uh, uh, promote it. So, so that's very much what we're doing. So if we develop the national employment policy in a certain country, uh, that is a deeply consultative process. It's not just the government or the ILO writing such a policy. It's something that is deeply consulted with certainly employers' organizations, the private sector, workers' organizations. But then also we would very much ensure that we have informal economy associations, informal sector associations, they're often called youth associations and so on, being represented at these consultations, having a, uh, uh, an important um, a role to play in that regard. I see very interesting other questions that I would love to go into, but I don't think we have time. Sorry. I think we'll be able to take some of the other questions again after the next two presentations. So thank you so much, Brent. Um, so we're going to be having two more talks. Um, the first is by Theodore Kuvat, um, and then the second is by Tatenda. Um, so Theodore Kuvas is a senior policy officer of youth employment at Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and he's also the program manager for Orange Corners Africa, specialized in urban area development with a strong passion for entrepreneurship and youth employment. And the next person is, that will be presenting is Tatenda Dumba, who is the regional financial advisor for the development budget for the Netherlands, for embassies in Tunisia, Libya, Morocco, and Algeria. While his main focus is in the financial field, he has a special focus on job creation and youth employment in Tunisia. So um, Theodore, you have the floor now. You have 10 minutes. And then after that, we can take the tender's presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you can, uh, you can see my screen right away now, right? We can. Perfect. I will, can you also see yourself in the right corner or not? OK, I'll just continue. Um, so indeed, my name is Theodor Kluvas, and I work for the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Netherlands Enterprise and Development Agency. Uh, I lead the Youth Employment and Entrepreneurship Team, and I'm also the Program Manager of Orange Corners. Um, thank you for checking my LinkedIn. It was really accurate. Um, I'm actually on a move now. I'm, I'm actually leaving the Orange Corners program, and I'm fully focusing on policy, on policy, particularly on education, because I think that's where it all starts. Um, the reason I was asked to, to to, to participate in this is because as you can see in this map, 
I have been traveling in all of those countries and understanding and mapping the ecosystems, predominantly for entrepreneurship. But it's after 10 countries that we soon realized that we also should look into the youth and the youth employability. Um, all the orange corners or all the orange countries is where an orange corner is taking place. An orange corner is a, is a corner inside an existing local hub run by a local team and then just supported by us in the Netherlands, giving them advice uh, on how to run such an initiative and how to be the best enterprise support organization in the country or in the city. Uh, there's more coming up and we currently have a network of 20 different hubs and we, pay, we put a strong emphasis on the community of practice so that they can learn from each other because whatever we do in the Netherlands, it doesn't really apply to what they're doing there. Um, everything that we do has a strong focus on evidence-based learning and programming because we are sitting on a gold mine assisting more than 800 entrepreneurs on a yearly basis. So imagine if all this data is really aggregated and we really use it in such a way that we can form our policies. This is new for us uh, as well. We've been doing this for the last year and we really wanna put even more emphasis in the coming year on this, not, not on ourselves, but we want the local teams, the local enterprise support organizations understanding the value of putting an emphasis on evidence-based learning and programming because they can improve um, the product, but also they can improve the ecosystem as a whole and also assist their governments in, in transforming and enabling their environment even further. Um, I'll quickly talk about our observations and I will be bold and I need to say that I'm speaking on behalf of myself and only myself. I work for the ministry, but this is Theodore speaking. I see entrepreneurship as a new religion. Why? Because I've been around for eight years and when I first came, it was only a few countries really focusing on entrepreneurship. Now the last years, we've seen a massive increase on hubs, which is not necessarily bad, but it's also not necessarily good. Because if you look at 2016, the World, Ma the World Bank had estimated 170 hubs. Now we've reached more than a thousand now, which is again good, but also not very efficient. And I will explain. And I'm not really well prepared, um, but I wanted to say that, um, I agree with everything that was said because what we see is that the demand is not really met by the supply. When we visit all those universities and all those TVs, we see that whatever is being taught is not always necessarily what the market needs, ending up having students that have or possess a certain knowledge that is not applicable to what is really needed. And also the future of work is different. As you can see in this picture, everything is about data. Internet is, is penetrating our life on a, on a, on a, on a fast pace. And especially this COVID uh, crisis has shown that Africa has the ability to be very resilient and the way and the, and, the, and the pace that our teams have adapted and our entrepreneurs in the different areas have adapted to this new normal was fantastic and very inspiring to see. I'm not saying that this is the case for the whole of the country. Of course, the infrastructure is still lacking uh, in terms of internet and, and internet is not yet a social good making it inaccessible for a large part of the population, if not the biggest part. Um, and for that, all collaboration is needed. When, I, when we look at the job infrastructure, it was not always, it, and it is not always there. Um, and I think this is an important observation that we always have is, um, I think both of you just touched upon it now, that you, we need to divide it better into entrepreneurs about of necessity, which is more the informal economy. I have no other choice, so I have to become and employ, I have to become an entrepreneur and employ myself. And entrepreneurs about an opportunity, which we love to call startups. And let's not go into the definitions of that. But what we see is that there is much more uh, going on when it comes to policies around entrepreneurship and less about the informal economy, leaving them again behind. Um, this is an, in, a, in a natural majority of our, of our observations. Having been to 40 countries in Africa and having studied their ecosystem, having worked with different ministers on all the levels uh, for the last eight years, we've seen that the demographics are playing a major role, but we have an outdated education system. All the NGOs that are out there now sifting their paradigma and sifting their work from whatever they were doing before now on entrepreneurship, they knew that these kids will become adults needing a job. 
So the education system is still lacking behind. And we see that th this is also causing a huge skills gap. So again, the market demand is not really met by the education supply. And we need a better bottom-up or top-down approach. Students and youngsters need to be motivated to express themselves, question things, and really get out there and rejuvenate themselves the ecosystem. And there's a large donor attention. Often that really leads to an NGO shift. I'm not gonna mention names, but we've seen majority of the shifts and even the multilateral organizations shifting the whole thing based on what our governments are saying and what our parliament wants to see. Ideally, they would love to see certain type of entrepreneurs, women in remote areas, disabled, and having any other type of issue because then you can say that you've had impact. But again, I know that I, I, I might sound very controversial, but what I wanted to say is that we really, really need to contextualize the problem and, and, and understand that what happens in Lagos or in Abuja or in Ogo State is different from what's happening in Bamako or what's happening in Luanda. All this attention on entrepreneurship has created a lot of eventpreneurs. And next to that, we've also seen that the government bodies are really competing with each other because from the World Bank to the ILO, to the Dutch, to the Germans, to the, to the Danish, to the Swedish, to the Canadians, to the US, they all do programs on entrepreneurship. So they see that there's a lot of money coming in uh, on this topic, but the lack of coordination and the lack of understanding of meaningful youth participation. And by the way, we've just created our first meaningful youth participation toolkit at the ministry. And we hope all our embassies will never again design anything for, for youth without them sitting on the table, evaluating and being part of the decision-making board. Um, and then there's another thing, all these policy documents are coming up, um, especially on entrepreneurship, what I'm talking about, but there's a lack of implementation and I, you'll understand it in the next slide. Um, and also multilateral organizations need to better contextualize. And I know that ILO is doing an excellent job. I was working at our embassy in Pretoria, um, and I've seen the work you do in the different countries, but this example needs to be followed by more uh, um, multilateral organizations and NGOs. Also, our colleague from um, Oxfam said that we need better contextualization um, and the governments need to understand that, that they're not the drivers, they're just part of that supply chain that is called job creation through entrepreneurs. And not to mention that climate, the current pandemic and the crisis uh, and the conflict is causing a lot of stress and not to mention culture that is not broadly accepted for uh, let's say young female young females to become entrepreneurs. And then this is happening on a regular basis. This is from 2019, I attended this one as well. President Kagame loves to put the attention on Rwanda that it is the startup nation and bring all the people and all his colleagues from the different countries together to discuss entrepreneurship which is very, very important because it's putting attention on the, on a pain point, which is enabling the environment, but it doesn't necessarily help the implementation of the different policy documents. Because if you look at this slide, this is the countries that have already ratified, and I'm, I'm talking about ratifying the Startup Act, um, and DRC is still not completely ratified, but Senegal, Tunisia, and I think I missed some countries already uh, have ratified it, and if you look at the research that is being done on the impact of it on jobs and on entrepreneurship, we can say that it has increased the intention, but it hasn't really increased the, the, uh, the amount of jobs created out of entrepreneurs. And all the other orange countries are the ones that are really wanting to engage and are working with it, but it needs to be on a more inclusive way. And the, and the government should understand that they are part of that bus and we need to move that bus together. It's like a Flintstone car. If one doesn't walk, it doesn't really go fast. Uh, so everybody needs to be on board. And I've seen such attempts in Nigeria where the presidency has appointed a special advisor, but also uh, Cyril Ramaphosa in South Africa that was attending actually the meeting two weeks ago and he was listening instead of talking. And that's what needs to happen. We need to listen more to them and understand them so that we can design policies and programs that have impact on everything they, uh, they, they are willing and wanting. Um, in our programs, we also say that we don't want to work and, and, and give them another donor money. So we work together with the private sector, making sure that they will fund the programs and that the local organizations will start 
working together with the private sector so that entrepreneurs can design solutions for those major private sector players. This is in a nutshell, a little bit of what I've um, been experiencing. I know it may um, look a little bit chaotic, um, but I hope you got uh, some glimpse of how I view and what my observations are in the region. Thank you so much, Theodore, and um, thank you for your um, interesting insights um, on this. Um, so next, we would be having Tatenda, um, who will also be making a presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Shmaka. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Great, thanks. Um, well, I'm not going to use any PowerPoint presentation for this one. I only have three points that I'm going to address. First of all, uh, to thank uh, Marike and uh, Ahmed and, uh, on the paper that, uh, they, uh, that they produced. Um, just my reflection on that paper, I have maybe like three uh, maybe takeaways that I got from, from it. Uh, first of all, uh, it was interesting to note, or at least to, to realize from case studies that you had, uh, that uh, while economic growth is necessary for, for job creation, it does not necessarily it, um, uh, it automatically mean that these, there are jobs that are being created. Uh, and you gave uh, good examples there as well. Um, I would also note as well that in the same sense, uh, the opposite is also true that uh, uh, job creation does not also necessarily mean uh, economic growth. And uh, maybe I can give an example of Tunisia in this sense that uh, uh, they also, above uh, other active uh, labor market policies that they have for the youth, they also have uh, uh, direct employment into the public sector, for example, uh, to such an extent that uh, there, an example would be that the national airline is, uh, is overstaffed and they have about 8,000 employees that they, they are trying to lay off, but you know, like because of uh, uh, um, social pressures, they cannot um, and they keep on uh, like hiring. And that doesn't really necessarily mean that there is anything improving in the economy, but on the contrary. So that was uh, an interesting point to, to note in your paper. You also mentioned that, uh, uh, and I concur, that uh, most youth employment policies are, uh, at least in the, in the countries that you, you surveyed, um, um, and that is the case as well in, uh, in the Maghreb region and in Tunisia in particular, um, are top down. So basically governments and uh, businesses, maybe, I don't know, but uh, usually governments would implement a policy or would come up with a policy, draft it out, and then uh, put it out there for the youth to, to take up or to pick up. And usually that has been seen, at least, uh, in, at least in your paper as well, that uh, it doesn't always work uh, because it, there's no inclusiveness. And uh, speaking on inclusiveness, uh, the third point uh, on this reflection, um, you also mentioned that there is a sticking point that sometimes governments do uh, have inclusiveness in, in mind. Um, so they include the youth in consultations, basically when they're trying to uh, draft the policy uh, on youth employment. Um, but uh, at least in all the three cases that you mentioned, they have, I noticed that uh, uh, the youth are almost always left out in the implementation stage. Uh, um, and for that, Maybe my question or to you uh, later on would be, why is that? So that, that's, the, that's basically the first uh, uh, point I have just to reflect on your paper and to thank you very much uh, on the paper. And then uh, I'll briefly mention uh, uh, this, the developments in the, in the Maghreb and in Tunisia in particular. Uh, you will all remember that uh, the, uh, the Arab Spring started in, uh, in the Maghreb region, in Tunisia in particular. Um, and it was particularly because of uh, youth unemployment, which is uh, unfortunately still uh, an issue uh, in, this, in this country. Um, and I'll try to briefly 
maybe highlight or at least what the government is doing. It's not like they're not doing anything, but uh, but most of what they're doing uh, is uh, active uh, labor market uh, policies. Um, uh, in Tunisia, for example, they have over 11 uh, that have been running since uh, 2010 and several that 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 are still running from before the the revolution in 2011 um, but you know they're a mix of 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 things contracts subsidies subsidies and everything but most of them have not been effective uh, at least until now uh, uh, and you know the, the discussion is still trying to to go on to try and see how how they can reform them or how they can tweak them uh, they also have a national youth employment policy as well that still you know the youth still feel uh, like this has not been effective yet um uh, and most development uh, partners or at least international and multilateral uh, 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 donors in the organizations are mostly focusing on trying to bridge the gap between uh, uh, youth uh, skills, employ employment skills, and uh, matching it with what the employers uh, are looking for. Um, however, from what we noticed, at least uh, uh, at, at, at the, at the uh, Youth Employment uh, Fund and, and at the Dutch, Dutch Embassy, um, is that that can be or is usually a simplistic uh, approach to view it and I would tend to agree with uh, with uh, the previous speaker Bernd from uh, IDOL that uh, there is a, a critical lack of job uh, or job offers and uh, labor demand in the market and that is uh, probably not being addressed enough. Um, I would say that uh, like in your in your paper, you also mentioned that uh, about twelve million youth are uh, are, are uh, put out into the labor market every year in Africa, uh, which means you know like every time you need to have more than or at least close to twelve million job offers, and that has not been the case at least uh, not in Tunisia. Um, and one of the things that we noticed was that uh, they, the, the economy is quite closed um, and has been a bit stifling for, for startups to such an extent that about 90 to 95 percent or even 99 percent of all uh, companies in Tunisia are all uh, micro uh, companies, uh, SMEs uh, and uh, micro SMEs. Um, with no with no growth perspective because they are being stifled uh, stifled out and crowded out uh, by taxation policies and other things, um, and if that keeps continuing, we might you know we can continue addressing um, youth policies as much as we like, but we will not really get much results uh, out of it. Uh, and at least that has been the case uh, since uh, since the revolution and probably before. Uh, in Tunisia. Um, what are we doing then as the Dutch uh, with the embassy here and uh, also in, uh, in the region? Uh, we are trying to go via a public sector development approach, basically trying to stimulate the public sector to create jobs. Uh, there are also challenges in that, uh, that usually when you come in as a donor with a lot of funds to try and stimulate uh, a private sector usually, then uh, there might be an effect of crowding out uh, that you know, people that are supposed to be doing it will basically sit on their hands and wait for you to do it. Um, uh, but but we are trying to engage with uh, multilateral institutions. So for example, in Tunisia, we have created a, um, a youth employment trust fund called TRACE and uh, Yes, we are focusing on agriculture, but uh, on the whole uh, agricultural value chains. Um, and we are trying to be flexible with this one. So, you know, basically it's, a, it's an adaptive, an adaptive uh, approach. So what works and what doesn't work, then we drop it off uh, and we basically review it every year. Um, and we're trying to, to match uh, uh, small farmers and small uh, uh, 
uh, agriculture entrepreneurs, maybe they can do processing uh, uh, or packaging, whatever, whatever stage they are in the value chains, uh, mesh them with uh, some grants, uh, also mesh them with some banks that you can give them guarantees that you know, to try and boost up and prop up their business. And if they can kick off, then you know, like they'll try to do generate, that's the, that's the hope and that's our aim, they'll generate jobs. Um, and preferably within uh, uh, within the youth uh, youth uh, target that we, that we have uh, from 15 to, to 35. Um, so yeah, so will that work? Is that 100%? Uh, probably probably not. Uh, it, it also requires a lot of engagement from uh, from the government, which at this point, of course, because of political reasons, um, uh, the political economy has not been very, very uh, uh, cooperative, uh, neither in Tunisia uh, nor in the region. Uh, uh, but, but it's a start, I would say, uh, to try and see, you know, like it from both sides, uh, both on youth employment and both on uh, uh, on private sector development. So, yeah. I would say that's um, that's all I have. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions afterwards. Thank you very much, Atenda, um, um, for your um, reflections and then for also responding to some of the points that had been raised by the previous speakers. It seems as though we have a lot of questions and discussions, and I have a feeling that if we had like an open debate, we're going to be here for two more hours. But I'll just ask a few more of the questions that we have, and then um, we'll try to wrap this up as quickly as possible. So um, this question, I will pose it to both um, Theodore and Bernd, um, since they both um, mentioned this point, and it seems as though the presentations from both of them have a little bit of a, um, a conflicting point, which I think it would be interesting for us to explore. So um, the question is, I'm curious about the contradicting view about supply greater than demand, not enough jobs versus demand greater than supply, not enough skills. And I know that this is an ongoing conversation as regards youth um, employment and youth at work. And then is it that there aren't enough jobs or there aren't enough skills? So both sides would argue for or against, <laughs> um, but but since Theodore just spoke, I like um, since the, um, um, I like Bern to comment on that, and then um, Theodore, you can make a comment on that, so that we just have you know some sort of um, I think clarity or consensus on this point. Thank you. Sure. No, that's fine. And let me try to give it a shot because it's it's a bit complicated and some it, it indeed can be confusing now. The way I would tackle this is, is that skills gap almost always is industry or even value chain specific or occupation specific. So you have a certain sector where yes, there's some demand, but you don't have the people in the population to fulfill these jobs. Usually these are white collar jobs, slightly higher level skilled jobs, uh, maybe in the financial sector, accounting, IT, whatever it may be. Uh, uh, where, where then investors struggle to get the, the right people. Now, in that case, it's an important constraint because if there is, I said it earlier, if there is this identified demand and skills are the bottleneck, then I'm all for skills training to try to fulfill those. Now, it doesn't take anything away from it that as a, as a, as a whole, on a macroeconomic picture, I'm absolutely adamant that there is not enough demand to absorb. Otherwise, we wouldn't have 34 something percent unemployment in, in, in South Africa, we wouldn't have these working poverty figures and so on that are presented. It's, it's very clear that structurally there's not demand, not enough demand for the labor power in the country. And, and that brings us to something that I think quite often we misunderstand the types of jobs that we need to create. We very often look for these sort of fancy, maybe even sexy, attractive type of job jobs because we think those are the only ones that are attractive to youth. Now I would challenge that. There's a saying that we need to we need to create the jobs for the labor force we have, not the labor force we wish we had. You see what I mean? So we need to create the type of jobs that actually people in an economy can fulfill. Those are more manual jobs very often in the African context. They might be more closer to the agriculture sector, 
very often they would be in the industrial or in the manufacturing sector. You don't need to have high level skills to work in a, in a factory or even in the textile industry and so on. And there are many other examples like that. But these are the type of jobs that actually can, are much more likely to be mass employment creation, creating. And that's what we need. We, we need the type of jobs, the type of sectors that can create really many, many jobs and that they can be the type of jobs that can be fulfilled by the labor force that is available in certain countries. From there, then we upgrade. You see, so, 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 so of course, it doesn't mean we, we, we need to say that, that, of course, Africans need to be in poor, can I say, Bangladeshi style uh, working conditions in the textile industry. That's not what we say. You also, at the same time, work with the textile industry, with the, uh, with the employers and the investors in that sector to upgrade those jobs, to improve the working conditions. So again, I said it earlier, I don't agree that it's either quality or quantity of jobs. You need to work on those at the same time and in parallel. And there's programs that do that quite well, actually. And I think there's a business case even for better working conditions if it's done well. But, but again, we need to create the jobs for the people that are. Sorry, I was a bit long, but I hope this sort of made sense to, um, um, to, to untangle that. Thanks. And um, thank you, Bernd. Um, so, Fyodor, would you like to also answer that question? Yeah, actually, I really agree with what Bernd said. Um, it's not about me saying that there is a lack of skills uh, coming out or, or the skill sets of the youth that are coming out of the university do not necessarily match the market demands. And when I say skills, I don't take it academically. I talk about soft skills and digital skills. Um, that we hear all those uh, CEOs telling us and all those also SMEs telling us that the youth that we're getting are not always up to speed to what we need. And that's where a, a gap is, 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 is created. Um, and what, what I would like to see is that when, they, when they, they come out of an education institution, whether that's Tetradi or not, it's not necessarily the most important thing, but I'd like to see them being more of creators of solutions, having that critical mindset and being able to identify that this is something that I could do or I could design and really produce that solution or create that product or service that is very much needed by the market that I'm in. Um, because often everything is imported or taken from somewhere else, whereas a lot of things could also be uh, produced locally. And we've seen different activities on that. A topic specifically like support South Africa, uh, South African products or proudly SA and some other countries do that the same. But I think it's very important to understand and to motivate um, students and, 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 and governments to shift the narrative inside education and create students that are better equipped for today's demand. And that's not necessarily industry related because as Bern said, if we want to create jobs, then why not plant another 10 million big greenhouses and employ thousands of people? That will be an easy solution uh, in a fertile ground that Africa is rich on. But that's not what everybody wants. So you need to diversify it. So it's not an easy answer. It's not an easy question to answer. Um, but this is a little bit my view. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And, and thank you. Um, I think at the end of the day, something that I'm hearing from this conversation is that it's not possible to say there is just one solution. And it's not, it's not possible to say this is the only way to approach this problem. It has to be looked at um, in a nuanced manner that takes into consideration a lot of factors as well as the local context to be able to solve this problem. So that's actually what I'm, I'm hearing or getting best from this conversation. So one more question I'd like to ask, um, and, and then I, I think I think Tenda can answer this, or Theodore, since you have both worked with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So um, there, they, we have had a lot of discussions today on policies and the policies that need to be implemented. However, the, the broader conversation for today's webinar is policies and government actions. So 
especially in Africa, we've seen that they do not always mean the same thing. Ratifying or, uh, or, or passing a policy doesn't always mean that it will be implemented. So, for example, Tatenda made mention of um, Tunisia that had passed the Startup Act, but still had an environment that was stifling for um, startup growth and MSMEs in the country. And then I am I'm Nigerian, and there's a lot of um, there's there, there's a, there are a lot of conversations in Nigeria about you know um, digital inclusion and digital growth. But then we also have, on the other hand, very very harsh economic policies and and laws and and actual actions by the government that stifle growth in these same sectors. So again, there's a little bit of the, a disconnect. So I'd just like you to maybe talk about um some of the ways or the sustainable ways that engaging with this government, um, some of the sustainable ways to ensure that, you know, policies lead to action. One, the policy lead to action and that these actions are not dependent on a particular set of government because what we see sometimes is so you have a conversation with this particular um, um, set of government officials and by the next term or the next person in power and then there's an overhaul and then you know you have to start from the beginning so that is a problem so i i don't know if you can touch on these um tatenda or theodore whichever one of you would like to answer this question tatenda you want to go first yeah uh sure i can try to answer that at least uh, for for the region the north african region here um, it's, it's not an easy uh, 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 approach, I would say, or it's, it's no easy solution to ensure that governments uh, uh, implement their policies as, as uh, they are on paper, basically. Uh, because the, there are a number of things, of course, that, that, that may uh, uh, hamper or like uh, 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 make it difficult for, for governments to implement these policies. For example, uh, in the paper you mentioned, uh, or they, uh, there was mentioned that uh, some, some, some governments have youth employment policies in place, but they don't have a budget uh, to see it through. Uh, and that's, that's not something that, you know, like you can magically come up a solution with. Uh, uh, most African governments are struggling with, uh, with financing their, their budgets, basically. Uh, that has a lot to do with developing G GDP and everything. It, it, it encompasses a lot of things. In, in, in the Maghreb region, one complication as well is that uh, they're trying to, to strike a balance between uh, uh, social stability and, uh, and, of course, economic growth and, uh, and, and inclusion, uh, especially when it comes to youth. The, 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 the countries are mostly very young. Um, and the more you go without giving them jobs uh, or you know giving them opportunities, then the more you are prone to social instability. So they want solutions and they want solutions now. So most of the times the governments have to cut corners, uh, you know, like employ them directly, you know, like into the into the into the public sector, even though that might not be sustainable, even though that might lead to a lot of difficulties down the line. Uh, or come up with a lot of patchwork uh, in, the, in their policies, you know, just to solve the immediate problem, which is a risk for social instability. You don't want to have revolutions every time. And that's understandable. Uh, on our side, as uh, at the Ministry of the Foreign Affairs, the Dutch Foreign Affairs, uh, there's also not much that we can do to force or to, you know, like uh, hold governments to you know, like to a set to a particular uh, uh, framework that we want, of course, because you know, like this, we we can only do so much uh, from the outside. Uh, however, we've been trying to to match our funds uh, with the with the policy adjustments, uh, of course, which is uh, the classic approach that uh, IMF and World Bank uh, uh, try to do every time uh, when they do uh, macroeconomic uh, uh, interventions. Uh, as well, is that perfect? Is that a perfect solution? Probably not, but but it's 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 something that we we are trying and and we're trying to see. But but the key is is that uh, we 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 remain flexible. Uh, if this doesn't work, then we need to, need to come back to the to the drawing board and see what what else can we do. There's also you know like 
much that we can do, uh, uh, basically. But uh, I, I guess that's my take on it. I don't know if you have uh, something to say on it, uh, Yeah, yeah, just a brief because I know we're running out of time. Uh, my brief take on that is like I've been involved in 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 uh, with our embassy actions in DRC. Uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo and Tanzania and some other countries and in Senegal with the Startup Act. Um, well, as a foreign embassy, we can definitely not interfere in, in local policies, but what we can do, we can empower them and foster them uh, once ratified. And as, as a donor community, we have a role to play, which is to advocate about ratification of certain things. And the reason mm -hmm. certain things are not really implemented is also because we always tend to shift our attention based on the low hanging fruits to be mm -hmm. precise. Like we tend to focus on the, on, the, on the big urban centers because that's where it's easier to do a program and easier to get the first results. But when it comes to such policies, we meet with all the other embassies and all the other colleagues from the different international organizations on a weekly, if not a monthly basis. Um, we can really uh, form a front and really help the ratification of such a, um, a policy document by breaking it down into pieces and, and sharing responsibility on the different fronts that this policy recommendation or policy document is actually um, suggesting. Like South Africa is gonna do now and like Nigeria is working on it very closely now as well with all the different actors of the ecosystem. And, and we fund a lot of those programs so we can have an indirect influence on this. Yet that doesn't mean that this will have the impact that it is desired. Again, a complex problem, but we certainly have a role to play and we should take responsibility on that as well as major funders of uh, youth employment programs. Thank you so much. Um, and unfortunately we have run out of time. I know I did mention that um, this could take forever to talk about, but I think that we have been able to make some very important points today. And most of all, even if we do not have the answers, all the answers to all the questions, I think that we have um, opened up um, points for discussion and further research and even stuff to work on for that. And I think some of the important points that were raised today, one, which is the most important to me as a young person, is that in conceptualizing and creating the policy down to implementation, it is important that young people are involved at every step of the process to ensure that it is truly inclusive and representative of what the young people in that community or country need. The second thing is that it is important to contextualize the problems as well as the solutions. Thirdly, I also um, want to mention um, what, what was presented earlier that some of these issues many of these issues are structural issues and not necessarily having just to do with specifically young people but structural issues that need to be addressed across board and would also have an effect on youth employment eventually and then finally something i'd like to mention is that the issue and the conversation around demands versus supply is complex and at the end of the day also has to do with the local context so it is important that um, any approach to policies and actions for to um talk up to address youth unemployment in africa is multifaceted is nuanced and takes into consideration all different factors that are affecting youth unemployment on the continent so once again thank you everyone for coming this has been a very great conversation i see that um theodore says we should um keep in touch with him on linkedin so please you can put your linkedin or emails in the chat so that you can connect afterwards Again, my name is Chamaka. We're going to be meeting again next week to continue the webinar series. I do hope to see many of you there. Thank you once again for joining where I'm so um, sorry to have taken a few minutes extra of your time. Um, but once again, I think this was a really fruitful discussion. Thank you to all our speakers for coming in. I learned a lot. And thank you to everyone who participated. This was a wonderful discussion. So see you next week at 3.30 on Tuesday again for another um, impactful and insightful discussion. Bye, everyone. Thank you.